Well, thank you, Dr. Aiken. First of all, I, there's not a place in the world that I'm more honored to come and preach than I am at Southeastern Seminary. And I, I want to echo what Danny said about the precious, precious women. The, 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 the dirty little truth in the Southern Baptist Convention is that the backbone of our churches are women, not men. And so I am, first of all, so grateful that, Danny, you're having that emphasis. And then we were, I was asking Charlotte, so you'll celebrate in May, you and Charlotte, 40 years of marriage together. My wife, Teresa, and I next month will celebrate 42. I'm more in love with my wife today than I day that I was that I married. In fact, I told her before I left, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. So um, I, um, I love my wife with all of my heart. Uh, Charlotte is the sister I never had. I can't thank uh, her enough for all she means to me. They're four boys. I'm their second dad. They'll tell you that. I love them like my own sons, and I'm honored to be here. Somebody asked me, uh, one of the students here, they said, you know, I got a question. How, how do you get so close to Dr. Aiken? You know, I'd love to get close to, go to Dr. Aiken and, and be a friend like you are. I mean, you guys are best buds. And I said, well, it's, I, I can tell you the secret sauce. I said, I learned it years ago, and it really has cemented our relationship. I said, we, we have two things in common. I said, number one, we both love the Georgia Bulldogs. So that, that's a big help, okay? I'm just, I'm, if you want to get close to Dr. Aiken, that's, you know, we both love the Georgia Bulldogs. But what really has cemented our relationship is we both love Danny. So uh, that's really kind of the big help that, that has kind of cemented uh, our relationship. Um, Got to hurry because I don't have a whole lot of time, but I, I do want to talk to you today about something. By the way, talking about funerals, th that situation's also reversed. If I die, he's going to do my funeral. So I told him last night, I said, Danny, if you don't come to my funeral, I'm not coming to yours. But anyway, <laughs> um, a few years ago, there was a family that visited our church. And uh, we got a follow-up email, uh, one of our staff did, from the dad that visited our church. Long email, and uh, in response, he had a major concern with uh, our church, and I want to just read a part of this letter. <clears throat> he said, my biggest concern is regarding your church's policies and views with whom they welcome and accept in, their, in your church. My view is that God is a loving God and created everyone in his image, to which, by the way, I agree. Everyone is all-inclusive. Last Sunday during my visit, I asked Pastor Merritt about the church's view on homosexuality. He came up after the service to ask me the question. In my opinion, if the church is willing to accept these people into the congregation, then they will accept everyone who wants to attend. By the way, I agree with that statement. They told me that they are welcome, but that it is a sin to be homosexual. Actually, what I told him was, it was a sin to live a homosexual lifestyle just as it is to live an adulterous lifestyle. I was very disappointed to hear him say that. That tells me that they would not that uh, they would not be welcome in your church, as your church, if you believes it is wrong to be homosexual. Again, I believe it's wrong to live a homosexual lifestyle. It appears to me you are welcome in your church as only as long as you believe as your church does. That last statement is false. <clears throat> My wife and I have many friends in the gay lesbian community. Our children's godparents are gay lesbian. I will not attend a church that will not accept my friends only because their views and lifestyles are different from the guy who is standing at the pulpit telling everyone in his congregation that God only loves certain people. Again, that's an absolutely false statement. I've never said in my ministry that God only loves certain people, and I've made it plain that everyone's welcome in our church. He continues, I regret to inform you I will not be returning. No surprise. I will continue to look for another church to take my family. It is very important to me to find a place I can take my children to learn about God the correct way. He loves everyone unconditionally. By the way, I agree with that statement. Preach it practically every Sunday. I will not have them taught to be bigoted towards anyone because of their views or their lifestyles. Now, I wanted you to hear that email because number one, it shows why what we're gonna talk about today, in my opinion, is vitally important. And number two, it illustrates one of the great things I think that we as a church, we as ministers of the gospel, we as a convention, we as followers of Christ should be known for and should make us distinct from everybody else. I believe that a church that is full of Jesus Christ followers and full of Jesus Christ and full of followers who are full of Jesus Christ will be balanced. And let me explain what I mean by that. There are some churches, and I've been in some, 
and they specialize in making people feel condemned. They, they will always tell you what they're against. They will rarely ever tell you what they're for. And they don't like just to step on toes. They love to stomp on feet. They major in guilt. And they love to put people on guilt trips. Got it. Then there are other churches. They don't want to make people feel condemned. Their number one goal is to make people feel comfortable. So they rarely, if ever, talk about sin. Or if they do, they don't call it sin. They believe the 11th commandment is thou shalt not offend. Their number one goal is to make sure that when you leave, you leave feeling good, you leave feeling happy, and everything is fine. I believe something is wrong with a church, on the one hand, that offends everybody or goes out of its way to be offensive. On the other hand, I believe it's equally wrong with a church that offends nobody and goes out of its way never to offend. When you study the life of Jesus, here's what you find. Jesus did not offend everybody all the time, but he did offend somebody some of the time. And the reason why he did that is because he was balanced. He was balanced perfectly. Now the question is, so James, what was he balanced between? What was it he held in perfect balance? Two things I'm gonna talk about today, grace and truth. He was perfectly balanced between grace and truth. If you brought a copy of God's Word, I want you to turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Let me give you the background of what we're going to read. John, as you know, was one of Jesus' disciples. He was a part of the inner circle. He was the one that authored this gospel that bears his name. And quite frankly, John was no ordinary disciple. Jesus loved all of his disciples, and, 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 and though he did not have what we'd call favorites, he did have what I would call intimates. He did have an inner circle. There were three that really got up close and personal with Jesus. They were Peter, James, and John. <clears throat> John is writing this gospel, and he tells us something about why Jesus was such a captivating, exhilarating, fascinating figure. So we pick up in verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. Now, we all know the first part of this verse is talking about what we call the incarnation. That is the unbelievable truth that God literally came to earth, took on human flesh, and became one of us and became just like us. And when John talks about seeing His glory, he's talking about all of his life from his birth to his death and his resurrection. John said it was an amazing thing. He said in his birth, he came out of a womb and in his death, he came out of a tomb. From the womb, he was God who came down from heaven, but from the tomb, he was a man who came back from the dead. Now we know all of that. We talk about it at Christmas and that's the foundation of what we believe about Jesus. But then John said, but I got to know this man in a way you didn't. I got to see this man in the way you didn't. I got to look at this man in the way you didn't. And there was something about this Jesus that was so unique. There was something about Jesus that drew all these people from all walks of life and everybody that met him wanted to touch him and hear him and a lot wanted to give their life to him. To him. And he said, so what was it about Jesus that made Jesus so magnetic that made Jesus so attractive. What was it about Jesus that when it came to the synagogue and it came to the Pharisees and it came to the Sadducees and it came to the scribes and it came to the seminary of that day, people were repulsed and people were, re, were, were, were rejected. But when it came to Jesus, these were the very people who flocked to Jesus. He says just this, verse 14, he was full of grace and truth. He was perfectly balanced. He was full of grace and full of truth. Now, if that is true, then if you're full of Jesus, you'll be full of grace and full of truth. If your church is full of Jesus, it will be full of grace and full of truth. If your ministry is full of Jesus, it will be full of grace and full of truth. Now, for Jesus, here's where we're different. For Jesus, it just came naturally. He was just always full of grace and truth, okay? Let's be honest now. For us, it doesn't come naturally because there's one thing I promise you that is true about every person listening to me right now. We tend to emphasize one trait or the other. Every one of us is true. 
This is true about every one of us. On the one hand, some of us are more into grace and some of us are more into truth. I'll give you an example. Take parents or take your parents, right? Every, I've never met parents that, are, that, that, that somewhat are not like this. If you'll study parents long enough, here's what you'll find. Dad will lean one way and mom will lean the other way. So for example, in my family, dad was Mr. Truth. Mom was Mrs. Grace. How do you think kids learn how to play parents against each other? You think they were born that way? No, they figure it out. Ah, oh, he's Mr. Truth. She's Mrs. Grace. So if you want to do something, who do you go to? You go to the grace parent. If you want to buy something, you go to the grace parent. If you want something for Christmas, you go to the grace parent. Now, incidentally, a quick word to those of us who are grandparents, that can change like that. Let me give you an example. When my boys were growing up, they will tell you this, they were here today. When my boys were growing up, who do you think Mr. Truth was? Me. Who do you think Grace was? Teresa, my wife. I was Mr. Truth. Teresa was Mrs. Grace. Guess what? With my grandchildren, I'm Mr. Grace. <laughs> Nana is Mrs. Truth. My little two-year-old grandson was over at our house the other day and, and I asked him to do something and he, he didn't, didn't want to do it. He acted up, kind of got a little snarly with me. You know what I did? I sat him down and I said, listen to me, Connor, look at Pop. If you don't do what I tell you to do, Nana's going to spank you. Now, you see, it can all change. It can all change depending on the object. So when it comes to us, some of us, let me tell you how this works as well. When it comes to ourselves, you know what we always do? We, we always are on the grace side when it comes to us. But when it comes to others, we always fall on the truth side. So we cut ourselves slack so we can cut other people up. But with Jesus, grace and truth were joined at the hip. They were perfectly balanced. He never shared truth at the expense of grace, and he never shared grace at the expense of truth. He was balanced. What I want to do today is I want to share with you why our churches need to be balanced, our convention needs to be balanced, our ministries need to be balanced, we as individual believers, we need to be balanced, and why this balance is so very, very important. So I want to say three things today about this text. Number one, we need the compassion of grace. We need the compassion of grace. Now listen again to what John said. He said, and not just what he said, but the order in which he said it. He said, Jesus was full of grace and truth. Now, I don't believe it was a coincidence that grace came first. I think John knew what he's doing when he said, let me put grace first. Let me tell you why. If you were a Jew 2,000 years ago, you'd understand exactly why Jesus did what he did. Because in the first century Jewish culture, most people valued truth. They wanted to hear truth Tell her. So if you were a Jewish child, you would grow up learning the Torah, you'd grow up learning the Jewish Bible from a young age, and you were just learned and schooled in the truth to the point that many young Jews had already actually memorized what we would call the Old Testament by the time, by the time they would get to be a senior in high school. And so John, knowing he's talking also to Jews, realized you understand truth a lot better than you understand grace because the overarching emphasis of the Torah was on truth. Because when you think about the Old Testament, what do we tend to think about? Commandments. You shall do this, you shall not do that. You shall go here, you shall not go there. You shall say this, you shall not say that. So you think about laws dealing with everything from divorce to diet plans. You think about regulations from temple sacrifices to annual festivals. Jews had a right way of doing things, a wrong way of doing almost anything. So the Jewish religion was all about Truth. Now, let me just stop so you don't understand. You do find grace in the Old Testament. People don't realize that. You find it all throughout. God was going to destroy the entire world in a flood because when he looked at the world, all he saw was evil. All he saw was wickedness. He even got to the point where he had regretted making the world, was ready to destroy it all. And then you read this beautiful verse in Genesis, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That word favor literally means grace. 
Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God in his grace chose not to destroy everyone or everything. The world wouldn't even be here today if it were not for grace. And that story, like many others in the Old Testament, illustrate grace. But the truth of the matter is, the primary emphasis of the Old Testament was not grace. The primary emphasis of the Old Testament was law. That's why John points out in verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. And then John said, but then Jesus showed up and the light of his grace shined out of his life so brightly, everybody could see it. When you got around Jesus, you could smell grace. You could taste grace. You could feel grace. Even if you didn't know what to call it, you knew somehow this is so different. This is why people who were so unlike Jesus, like Jesus. Jesus loved hanging out with sinners and sinners loved hanging around Jesus. And Jesus drew unbelievers and lawbreakers like a magnet draws iron. And I want to be honest. That's why I want to be full of Jesus. Because if, if we were just being honest right now, let's just tell the truth. Most people that we call sinners today don't want to be around most people who call themselves Christians. That's true. And the reason is we don't show very often or at least often enough that what Jesus showed all the time and that is grace. And John said, when Jesus burst on the scene, the light of the grace of his life burst through like the morning sun. In Jesus, the stern face of the law was transformed into the shining face of grace. Unbelievers who met Jesus knew instantly without him ever telling them, you love me, you care about me, I'm important to you. You really care about my past and my present and my future. And I can't explain it, but somehow Jesus, I can already tell you want what is best for me. We need the compassion of grace. Number two, we need the conviction of truth. We need the compassion of grace, but we need the conviction of truth. Now listen again. Let's read the verse with a different emphasis. Jesus was full of grace and truth. See, Jesus was not one-sided in his approach to, pe to people. You know, the, the national symbol of our country is an eagle, and you've seen it before. You'll notice in, in the left talon are, are 13 arrows, and the right talon is an olive branch. And, and what that symbolizes is we're a nation that desires peace, that's the olive branch, but we're a nation that is ready for war. That's the arrow. In the same way, Jesus always brought two things to every table he would sit at. In one hand, he says, I'm here to give grace. In the other hand, I'm also here to give truth. And I'll tell you why that's so important. There is a caricature in our culture today, and I call it the Jesus who is sugar and spice and everything nice. It is the Jesus who is tolerant of everything and everybody. It is the Jesus who says, hey, look, here's how it's going to work. I don't care how you live. I don't care what you do with your life. I don't care whether you're sexually pure or not. I don't care whether you use profane words or you speak praise. I don't care. I'm okay. You're okay. We're all okay. And that's the cultural Jesus. It's the Jesus who fits in perfectly with the favorite theology of most Americans today, which is it is wrong to ever tell anybody that they're wrong. H. Richard Niebuhr, a famous Yale Divinity School professor, said, we've created this make-believe spiritual fantasy where a God without wrath brings men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministry of a Christ without a cross. And it perfectly signifies what it is to be all grace and no Truth, I'm gonna make this, say this again. Jesus was full of grace and truth. When I preach, I wanna preach with grace. That's the way I wanna preach. What I want to preach is truth. You give grace, you give truth. Let me tell you how it works. Grace says, there is a way to God for anyone. Truth says, there's only one way to God. Grace says, Redemption is possible. Truth says repentance and turning from sin is necessary. Grace says, I love you just the way you are. Truth says, I love you too much to let you stay that way. Grace says, I love sinners. 
Truth says, I hate sin. Grace says, anybody can come to God. Truth says, everybody must come through Jesus. Grace says, God is love. Truth says, God is holy. Grace says, there's a heaven and you can go there. Truth says, there's a hell and you can go there. Grace says, there is salvation for all who desire it. Truth says, there is judgment for those who don't. Grace says, you are saved by grace through faith. Truth says, faith without works is dead. We need the compassion of grace, but we also need the conviction of truth. Now, when you put those two things together, that leads me to my conclusion. If we need the compassion of grace and we need the conviction of truth, therefore, we need the combination of grace and truth. So listen again to John's concluding statement. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In other words, grace and truth are joined at the hip. Let me tell you why this is so important. Grace without truth is deceptive. Truth without grace is defective. So let me put it to you mathematically. Grace minus truth equals liberalism. Truth minus grace equals legalism. Those who want truth without grace are quick to judge and slow to forgive. But grace plus truth equals liberty. So if you, if you want grace without truth, you'll be quick to excuse and you'll be slow to confront. If you want truth without grace, you'll be quick to judge and slow to forgive. One is liberalism, one is legalism, but only one brings liberty. You know this, I don't have to tell you this, birds need two wings to fly. Because with only one week, they're grounded forever. Guess what? We ought to be preaching the gospel. Danny and I were talking about the gospel just a while ago. The gospel is our most important message. Paul said, I deliver unto you that which is of first importance, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only reason we're here today, the only reason we are who we are and have what we have and do what we do, the only reason there are churches and seminaries is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But even the gospel has to have two wings to get off the ground. It's gotta have grace, and it has to have truth. I wanna speak truth, but I wanna do it in the spirit of grace. I wanna give grace, but I wanna do it in the spirit of truth. See, Jesus was not 50% grace and 50% truth. He was 100% grace and 100% truth. He wasn't grace on Monday and truth on Tuesday. He was all grace all the time, 24 seven. When you go to his ministry, you see it over and over and over and over. On the one hand, he was all grace. He welcomed sinners and tax collectors. Would go to their home, eat meals with them, and hang out with them. He would put his arms around the bare skin of a leper when nobody else would come within a country mile of one of those people. He welcomed little children to come and sit on his lap. He would touch the untouchable. He healed the lepers, the lame, and the blind. He even made sure he was so full of grace. He made sure a convicted felon that was hanging on the cross next to him received eternal life before he died. He lived full of grace. He died full of grace. But he was also all truth. He condemned the religious leaders of his day and called them liars and hypocrites. He talked more about hell than he talked about heaven. He said, you want to be my disciple? No fine print in the contract. You've got to take up your cross daily and follow me. He looked at the city that he loved more than any place on earth, the city of Jerusalem, and he said, judgment is going to come on you because you rejected me and the God that sent me. Now, let me tell you what I've learned. I've learned this. When you're full of yourself, you will either be full of truth and empty of grace, or you will be full of grace and you will be empty of truth. And I wanna make a confession. If you were to go back in my early ministry and listen to some of my earlier messages, and I'm, I'm just making an honest confession, I preached a lot more truth than I did grace. I leaned a lot more on truth than I did grace. I'm guilty as charged, and I had to learn by experience that the more full I am of Jesus, the more I'll be full of both grace and truth. 
You know, we're all made, the building blocks of life is, is DNA, and, and I'm gonna show you, this is a strand of DNA. You know, the building block of, D, uh, building, uh, uh, building block of life being DNA, DNA has a double helix, and it's perfectly balanced at the core of life, of life. You've got two strands of DNA, they wrap around each other in this beautiful, perfect symmetry. They run in opposite directions, and while they're doing that, they correct each other simultaneously, and they keep each other in perfect balance. And when that breaks down, you get cancer, and when that breaks down, you die. Even the very fabric of my life is totally dependent upon a perfectly balanced core of DNA. And I'm here to tell you today, grace and truth should be our spiritual DNA. They are the building blocks of living a Christ-centered life. Martin Luther once said, the devil doesn't care which side of the horse we fall off of, fall off of as long as we don't stay in the saddle. Well, I don't wanna fall into the ditch of liberalism. And I don't want to fall into the ditch of legalism. We need to ride the horse of the gospel with the one foot in the stirrup of truth and the other in the stirrup of grace. Now, here's what's so sad. So many unbelievers out in the world today, they only know two kinds of Christians. They either know Christians who speak truth without grace or they know Christians who give grace without truth. I told our church, when, when people walk into our church and they leave, I want our people to always see in us someone who in a spirit of grace loves them enough to tell them the truth. So now I want to answer a question. I want to make this very practical. Let, let's get down to where you and I live every day of our life. If you believe what I say is true and you believe that you know, we ought to be balanced, you believe we ought to be full of grace and truth, let's be honest. First question I want you to ask yourself is this. So which way do you tend to tip the scale in your life? Because we all tip it one way or the other. I'll be honest with you. I'm more of a truther than I am a gracer. Danny, you know me. I'm just, that's, my gift is prophecy. That's, I'm, just, I'm just geared that way. I'm more of a truther than I am a gracer. Some of you say, well, no, James, I don't have that issue. I'm more of a gracer than I am a truther. All right, now here's the question. First of all, which way do you lean? Because your answer will reveal where you need to become more like Jesus and more full of Jesus. So for example, maybe you're like me. Maybe you are a truther. Maybe there's a situation where you were right in something you said to someone, you were right in a stand that you took and you won the battle, but you lost the war. Maybe there's someone you're thinking about right now that you need to go to, maybe you need to give them some grace. On the other hand, maybe there's someone that you've actually hurt and you've actually harmed and you've actually enabled because you gave them all grace and no truth. Maybe you need to go back to them and give them some loving words of confrontation or counsel on a different direction they need to take in their life. And if you still haven't quite bought into what I'm trying to give you today, let me just kind of close with this. If you'd like to find the perfect balance of grace and truth, go to the cross of Jesus. Because grace and truth were joined at the hip at the cross. Because here's what happens. When you stand at the foot of the cross and you look up at the cross, you're gonna hear two voices speaking. You're gonna hear the voice of grace and the voice is gonna, of grace will be saying, no matter how sinful you are, your sins can be forgiven. On the other hand, you'll hear the voice of grace, that's a truth that says, but the only reason your sin can be forgiven is because this man died for your sin and you must receive him as your Lord and as your Savior. So I want you to think about that moment that Dr. Billy Graham just recently experienced when he went to sleep and he woke up in heaven. I want you to think about, let's just kind of fast forward, and I want you to think about that moment when you draw your last breath and you open your eyes and you're in the presence of God. You're in heaven. I believe at that moment, I believe the moment we step through the portals of eternity and we walk into the hallway of heaven, I honestly believe maybe more than we've ever seen it, you're gonna see grace and truth eternally personified. Because I believe when we walk into heaven, grace is going to be when you say, wow, I'm here even though I don't deserve it. Amen. And then truth is going to be when you look into those nail-scarred hands and you say, I'm only here because you died for me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, may our life 
our ministry, our words, our actions, all that we are and all that we have, may it always be balanced between grace and truth. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.